Welcome to Deerwood Realty YouTube channel. I'm John Schenk, founder and managing broker of Deerwood Realty in St. Louis, Missouri. Hmm. It seems as the presidential candidates have ventured into the housing world. Don't think that's really a good idea, but uh, we're going to go over it. Let's get straight to the article. I found this on Realtor.com. I thought it was very interesting, and I thought it was something we could talk about. So let's just do that. It says... Ahead of the 2024 presidential election, home prices and housing affordability are emerging as hot issues in the swing states that will decide the election. Now, I would just say that housing affordability probably affects every state, not just the swing states. It says an analysis of Realtor.com affordability score data shows distinct trends separating red states, blue states, and these seven key swing states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. It says, on average, red states are more affordable than the U.S. as a whole, and blue states are less affordable. The swing states' average sits in the middle, slightly more affordable than the national average. Those relative trends have held even as affordability declined across the board. Huh. Okay. All right. It says, President Joe Biden, a Democrat, addressed the housing crisis in his State of the Union this spring, proposing tax credits for some buyers and sellers, measures to boost construction. His Republican opponent, Donald Trump, took the opposite tack, accusing Biden of waging an attack on the suburban lifestyle that would reduce home values. Interesting characterization. It says, our affordability data shows that, in a sense, the two candidates are speaking in two different worlds of voters. But in November, what will matter most is how they are received by voters in the toss-up states that will decide the election. I, I would just say, spoiler alert, I don't think that anyone, I, I don't believe that people are one one issue voters really don't and i and i really don't think of all the issues that this is going to be the number one issue housing affordability i mean in real estate we'd like to believe that it would be right we'd like to believe we're more important than everyone else and that's great but i just don't i just don't see i don't see that anyone really thinks that anybody running has any solutions for this issue it says, generally, states that vote Republican are more affordable than the U.S. as a whole, and states that vote Democrat are less affordable. Okay. So then it gets to how they measured, and I have a link of the article in the description if you want to take a look at it yourself. It says, in March, the national average affordability score sat at 0.65. Iowa had the highest state score at 0.93, but no state scored above one, indicating home affordability is a challenge across the country. Right. I think, I mean, that's probably true right now. It's weird that Iowa's at the top. I don't know. It says, the relative dynamic separating the red, blue, and swing states has held at least since 2016, even as affordability has worsened across all states and the U.S. since 2021. And I would just go back to that sentence as kind of the, uh, the answer to the question, will the housing affordability question be the number one issue for voters? Um, We've, I, I just don't see it. I, I just don't see it. It says, it's important to note that the Realtor.com affordability index reflects only home prices and not rents. Rent affordability is also a challenge nationwide, with nearly half of all, ten, all renters in the nation spending more than 30% of their income and a quarter spending more than 50% on rent each month. However, it's unclear whether that issue would break down along similar political lines. And I, and I just, like... The, the, the problem here, like we're using affordability, but really it's inflation that's eating our lunch. It's a tax, it's an, especially a tax on the poor. Um, and this has all been going on um, since the Trump presidency. I mean, this isn't not something new. Um, so I, I mean, if you can't afford to rent, you can't afford to buy, I think you're still in the same boat. It says, census data shows that on average states that vote Republican tend to be more rural. The, that lower average population density could be one of the factors in mitigating the housing crisis in those states. But I mean, even if, but just because something's more affordable doesn't make it affordable, right? It says, then there's a fellow I get a quote from, it says, an associate professor of public administration at Tennessee State University suggested that the differences in home affordability in red and blue states could boil down to simple differences in geography, which, which I tend to believe with. I mean, if you, like, if you are in a major city, you're going to see houses that are more unaffordable at this time than other places. Now, that doesn't explain Austin, which is kind of getting hammered right now. 
And what, that was a place for a huge amount of growth. And now it looks like that's, that's kind of a mess. But I'm not in Austin and I've never been to Austin. I just read the stats. It doesn't look good right now, right from there. But they had a huge run up in prices. It says the Rust, Rust Belt swing states grappling with the economic impact of deindustrialization have all experienced lower than average population growth in recent years. They also have, have higher home affordability scores than the national average, though affordability in this case is a relative term. Affordability scores in the Rust, Rust, Rust Belt are still down from 2021 levels. Yeah, I mean, like, if nobody wants to live somewhere, if they're moving out, if, they're, if, you, if you see net migration out of the state, you would expect that the prices would go down. Michigan, which saw a population decline of 0.4% from April 2020 to mid-2023, according to the census, had the highest affordability score of all the swing states at 0.89. Pennsylvania was not far behind with a score of 0.84, and the two states were both among the most 10, I'm sorry, among the 10 most affordable states for home buyers. I mean, this is, I mean, this is kind of like if, if, if less people want to live there, if there's less of a demand to live in a, in a state, you'd think the price would be lower. Now, that, that doesn't say nice things about Iowa. Nevada and Arizona in particular rank very poorly for home affordability after years of explosive population growth. Both states scored 0.49 for affordability in March, putting them on the list of the top 10 least affordable states in the country. And that's the way it would seem to be, right? The states that have more growth and more population growth should probably see an increase in unaffordable homes. Then it gets into how it could play into the election. So let's look at that. It says, polling shows that voters rate housing affordability as a top concern, but it's less clear which party stands to benefit. A national survey last month from the University of Michigan and the Financial Times found that concern over one's own ability to afford housing was evenly distributed politically with about 70% of Democrats, Republicans, and Independents ranking that issue, issue among their top concerns. I just, I mean, I really have a hard time believing that this is a top five political issue, a voting issue. It says, we know affordable housing has been a challenge. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it by, by one here. It says, Biden has made housing affordability a key issue of his re-election campaign proposing a $10,000 tax credit for first-time home buyers and people who sell their starter homes. That proposals and other Biden has made to boost available inventory would have to pass a divided Congress. But they would have provided with Biden, but they have provided Biden with key talking points as he seeks to appeal to renters and prospective home buyers who feel priced out of the market. So, basically what they're saying is Biden is talking to those people who feel they've been left out of the housing market. Even if his proposals don't work, or aren't going to work because of a divided Congress. He's at least talking to those people who are affected. And then it says, meanwhile, Trump has veered in the opposite direction, tailoring his message to existing homeowners and arguing that Biden's proposals would erode their home values. They will use the power of the federal government to abolish zoning for single family homes, destroy your property values by building giant multifamily apartment complexes in the suburbs, and even next to your house, Trump said in a recent campaign video. And, and, that is not the same message as Biden has. And to me, that's a messaging problem. I mean, what, what is Trump going to do about affordability? Well, we'd have to acknowledge that inflation has, you know, really caused problems. Well, how do you fix inflation? Well, stop printing money. It's not that hard. But that is, okay, so then it says, but as it stands, Realtor.com data suggests that Biden's message on home affordability could find the most traction in those states already likely to vote for him. Well, I think that, that's, that's obvious. It's, then this is an interesting last quote, and then we'll go on to some questions. It says, that's definitely going to be an issue for voters here. He's talking about uh, Nevada, I believe. Yes, says Maurice Page, an executive director of Nevada Housing Coalition. Uh, they're probably not Republicans, just putting that out there. No one should have to choose between paying, and by the way, they may say that they're not, they're, they may say they're nonpartisan, okay? But if you look at every single person in that organization and how they vote, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be even f close to 50 50. No one should have to choose between paying rent, mortgage, child care, health benefits, or how much food they can put in their pantry. 
Now this, now look, the study of economics is the study of scarce resources. In fact, it, the, the whole thing is, is that resources are scarce and how should we best utilize those resources? That's economics. The idea that people, like even if you had all the money in the world for a house, you would still have to make decisions about paying rent, well, paying, paying for childcare, health benefits, or how much food they put on their pantry. Like these, we make these decisions all the time. Or how we're going to fix our car. Or what, what color we're going to paint our, our room. I mean, life is all about making decisions. I think that quote is absolutely silly. So, anyway, that's, that's the article. I thought it was kind of interesting. Kind of wanted to bring it to you. Now, um, I did have some questions that I, and I, that I put together, and I... I just wanted to go over them with you here. I'll just set it up like this. So one of the questions is, these are kind of just things to think about. It says, how does the struggle for housing affordability reflect broader socioeconomic inequalities in the United States? And I, I said, that's strange to me because housing affordability has relatively recently got out of hand as a result of inflation, uh, which started during the Trump's uh, presidency and has continued during Biden's time. I, I don't, I, I just, I don't understand. I mean, housing is always expensive. Now it's, now it's more expensive relative to the past, but I mean, it's never been like you could just go walk and buy a really, really nice house in the suburbs for like a thousand bucks, right? And there's another question. It says, in what ways... Might the political debate around losing a around housing affordability influence public trust in government? Now, if you think, I don't think anyone should trust the government. I mean, like, look at the Church Commission. If you if you have any questions, look at the Church Commission, and then go from there. Okay, trusting the government's a bad idea. They can't do anything. It's, that's not, it's it's a ridiculous question. How, uh, can housing affordability be seen as a fundamental right? And if so, how should it be insured? I don't think housing affordability is a fundamental right. And I think that the more political you make anything, the more expensive it gets. Uh, the best policy would be to let to end the Fed and the artificial manipulation of the currency. That's, that's what I think. Sorry. Uh, it says, what are the ethical considerations of prioritizing housing affordability in election campaigns? And I thought this was an interesting question because there are no ethics when it comes to election campaigns. None. I, I, don't, know, I don't know who thought there were. It's an absolute mudslinging extravaganza. Is it wrong to tell people that you're going to fix the housing affordability crisis and then not do anything? Probably. <laughs> but it's not going to stop any politician from promising everything. Another question, how might housing policies affect community cohesion and social stability in the swing states? Now, why limit it to the swing states? Uh, if people cannot afford housing, they will look to do different things socially. This is why I was never a big backer of the idea of multi-generational housing. People seem to be excited that people were living with their grandparents, parents, and kids. I've always seen that as a symptom of housing unaffordability, not something to be lauded. I mean, I just don't, I mean... People, people come up with different ways to live socially because they can't afford, you know, on their own. So I don't find that to be a good thing. Um, and then it says, to what extent should the government intervene in the housing market to ensure affordability for all? Uh, and then my question would be, what has the government ever done that helps all, especially when it comes to affordability? Take cars, for example, vastly more expensive with all the safety requirements. College tuition, how's that going? Uh, the, the, the idea that the government's going to ensure housing affordability for all is absolute joke. How can political candidates balance the interest of homeowners and renters in their housing policies? And that is a good question. Is it wrong for people to want to rent for the rest of their lives? I don't think so. Are homeowners and renters' interests different? I don't think that much. I think people want to put a roof over their head. Some people want to live in apartments. Some people want to live in condos. Some people want to live in houses. I want to live on a farm. And, and, and you should have that option. I don't think that those interests are, are conflicted. You, you want to be able to afford it, right? Now, we can argue about, you know, what affordability is, how to measure it. But still, I, I just don't think that, I don't think the interests of the people are conflicting. 
Um, then we get to the next question. What role does corporate influence play in shaping housing policies and how can it be mitigated? Well, uh, to me, the, the interesting thing here is when we look at the corporate influence, um, it may not actually be coming from the real estate sector. So from the builder's perspective, uh, a remodeling perspective. I don't think that it's coming from them. Uh, big banks and Fed policy are critical in financing development and mortgages. I mean, the things that a bank can actually um, invest in pretty much is just mortgage-backed securities. And that's a mandate from the Fed. So those are the people that are running housing policy. Um, and I don't think they have the interest of anyone in mind like a normal person. Um, they don't care. And then this was the last question. How do cultural attitudes towards home ownership differ across political and geographical lines in the U.S.? And I, I said, I think that's an interesting question as well, but does it matter? We live in a country where people can afford homes and places to, uh, to rent, or we should live in a country. Uh, I believe that comes with a competitive marketplace, which we don't really have right now, is we have financialized single-family homes, which is terrible for the health of housing stock over the long term. You know... I think that I think the mom and pop investors of a hundred homes or 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 less, the vast majority of them, can combined with Wall Street and the institutional investors have um, found housing to be very lucrative for themselves, um, and that's at the expense of housing affordability for everyone else. It doesn't matter your politics, I don't think doesn't matter about geographical lines. I mean, no matter where you live, you still want to be able to place to afford. And if, you know, somebody down the street owns 17 houses on the block, um, they pretty much control the pricing on that, uh, on that block. So anyway, with that, I'm going to head on out. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'll catch you on the next one.